One of the things that Kathy Colwitz is known for are her self-portraits. And I've just put a few up. Uh, oh, throughout her life, she uses herself as a model over and over and over again. These are really the only portraits that she does. Um, and so I have here, too, at uh, early in life, 1893, uh, when she's uh, seated at a desk, presumably drawing. A lot of tenebroso, dark shadows, and just uh, uh, the figure emerging from the dark by the light of, uh, in this case, this one uh, light source. Um, the other hand is uh, when she's uh, in old age, uh, and she doesn't spare herself. In fact, I've seen some pictures, and she's actually, <laughs> she's actually prettier than the pictures, although even when she was a young woman, um, I, her, her, I, her mother is, is said to have said, well, Kathy is not a pretty girl. And uh, she probably knew this from the beginning. Um, but uh, I guess that's not the point. Uh, they're just very, very powerful images. And in one way, it's really interesting because you do see um, her showing herself aging. And they're very powerful images. I'm just going to let you look at some of them. Uh, and all different media. Um, I think these are probably lithographs and draw. And uh, you can see here with the image where she's in 1921, where she's leaning up uh, with her, you know, her head, her hand is against her, is leaning against her head. Uh, what I meant by this combination of realism and expressionism, uh, because the face is. You know, complete understanding of anatomy, the structure of the of the, the face, the same thing with the hand. Uh, so very realistic in that sense. And yet the graphic elements, the elements of line, uh, they're controlled. I want to say they're scribbly, but I don't mean out of control scribbly because they build up the shapes, as you can see, as it curves around the shoulders or uh, follows the contours of the face or the hands. Um, but the, hand, the, the lines themselves, you know, have this uh, very expressive element. Uh, here's a couple that are woodcuts, uh, and once again, you have that strong, dark, light contrast. I particularly like woodcuts. Uh, and here, from 1933, uh, close up, and then uh, the gesture of the arm. And like, like I said, you can see that complete um, understanding of anatomy, the structure of the form, and yet the lines themselves become powerful abstract elements. Uh, also the shape here of the, the figure where she's raising her arm, what an interesting negative shape and an interesting positive shape that is. Time and time again she portrays women and children uh, not in a comfortable circumstance, uh, starving. I haven't tried to show you all of them. There's, um, I remember uh, reading the, you know, reading the, some of the ones that had words on them, and one was uh, a poster for the the children of Vienna are starving, things like that. Um, there's a picture where the the mother, her children are pulling at her skirts, and the title is "Brot" or "Bread." In other words, they're starving; they have no food. Um, so here is. Uh, the widows and orphans. And what I want to show you is that she takes these images and comes back to them. She revisits them and does them over again in different media. Um, so here we see the, you know, the crowd of women and children, and I want to see how this develops. Uh, here we have another drawing. It's called The, the Mothers. Uh, the drawing itself is in Boston. Um, has just uh, little little touches of sort of uh, uh, grayish blue uh, within the blacks and the whites. And in this case, the mothers have become this sort of a dome-like shape, uh, compact, wrapping their arms around their children, trying to protect their children from whatever the threat is. You could almost imagine mothers going to a concentration camp, uh, something like that. Um, this becomes a woodcut, as you can see. Um, so we've had it here, litho and drawing and woodcut. And I don't have the image to show you, but it also becomes a sculpture uh, later on uh, with that 
not, not identical, but you know the same idea of the, the compact forms. And she often does use that compact form, that shape uh, of holding the child, as, as we'll see. Um, this is a woodcut that I particularly uh, find particularly moving. Uh, here, the dead child, uh, the mother holding her child. And once again, she's not trying to show you beautiful people. I mean, this is so primal, it could, you know, it could almost be a cave woman or something, you know, that it's, it's, but the emotion is there. It doesn't matter if you're beautiful or not, if your child is dying. Um, she uses the, the theme of death over and over and over again. Here, death is a, you know, almost some kind of shadowy monster who has grabbed and is uh, twisting the woman who is fighting. She's almost a Michelangelo-esque you know, muscular figure fighting against death and, of course, has no hope of winning. And her child is, is, you know, is trying to cling to her and bring her back. So that becomes even more, it's not just some, you know, some woman, it's a mother. And what's going to happen to the child if the mother dies? Um, she takes her media, she, she mixes the media, if you will. Um, she's using, of course, etching and dry point, just like um, you know, Rembrandt combined etching and dry point. Sometimes she uses aqua tint. Um, I found that she was supposed to use sandpaper, and I suspect that she's sanded parts of the plate, is what they're talking about, or possibly used sandpaper in a soft ground etching. I don't know exactly how the textures were created. Um, here is another image. Um, death grabbing this woman um, and she's holding on to her child uh, and so is death trying to take the child and the mother has inserted herself between them and is struggling with death to keep death from killing her child? Uh, is death trying to take both of them? You know. Yeah. But the, one of the interesting things to me about this, because I am a Northern Renaissance art historian, uh, is the tradition. Death and the maiden, uh, death and all sorts of things, goes back to the whole idea of uh, dance of death. Uh, but one of the people who's very well known for showing this death and the maiden, death and a woman, uh, is Hans Balding Grun. Um, Balding? Uh, he was a pupil of Albrecht Dewar's and uh, an independent artist, obviously. Uh, and he does many prints and paintings of things, you know, horrific, horrifying scenes like uh, witchcraft and death uh, taking these young, beautiful uh, women. And here um, we have death, who is a kind of a skeletal figure with rotting skin and flesh embracing the woman uh, like she's a lover. And you'll notice the pose is, it's, it's similar in a sense because uh, death, you know, leaning over the woman, uh, the heads together, uh, the woman's elbow up. Uh, you know, it's, it was, it's very interesting to me to see how she takes this traditional German theme and makes it so immediate and so much more meaningful. Um, I definitely wanted to show this. She did a series, some posters, and some of these posters just seem like very, very free drawings um, with, you know, written, <laughs> handwritten words on them. Um, and this one, I think, expresses her feeling strongly. Uh, Nie weiter Krieg. Never again war. Um, Her family was pacifist. They, they, you know, she was opposed to war. For you can see this in her artwork. Um, you know, World War One was devastating, and this, of course, is after the aftermath of that. Uh, World War One broke a lot of the preconceptions that people had about war. You know, because people would go out to fight in foreign wars, and they'd come up with these stories about how glorious it was to die for your country and everything. It was happening around them. I mean, and people were. Uh, you know, young men were just dying. They weren't fighting. They were just dying in the trenches from mustard gas. You know, there was um, people, civilians would find themselves in a battle. I mean, they'd just be living there, and suddenly their farm would become the battle place. Um, the realities and the horror of the war that was supposed to end all wars 
as we called it once upon a time, um, brought a lot of people to oppose war. And one of the things she says, it is a new idea, the idea of human brotherhood. I'm not sure whether it's a new idea, uh, but it seems like something we're still trying to learn. Here you're seeing that same kind of shape. Obviously, I find these very, very moving. The same kind of shape uh, where you have the kind of dome shape, the compact forms united in embracing each other. In this case, two figures, the parents. And once again, she uses this theme of the parents in several different media. Um, what you're seeing is the grief of the parents completely bowed over because they've lost their child. Now, Colwitz knew about this. Her son Peter died near the beginning of World War I in 1914. Her grandson Peter, named for her son, died on the Eastern Front during World War II in 1942. So she knew about losing children um, firsthand. And here you see the drawing, and you, uh, you see the two, two drawings um, where you're changing it into uh, the woodcut, of course, comes afterwards. And then we see this in sculpture. Now, in this case, it's two figures. It's as though the two figures have been separated. Uh, the man is hugging himself on his knees, trying to remain upright. The woman is bowed down with grief. Um, this has been given a number of names, just the parents, uh, the grieving parents, the memorial to the fallen. Um, she worked on this for many years. Uh, this sculpture was her monument to her son, who was buried in the cemetery. Um, probably always heard the phrase, in Flanders Field, the poppies grow. Uh, and of course, they have a lot of the World War I cemeteries in Belgium, which was a big battlefield. Um, so this is the Valdasso Cemetery in Belgium. And you say details here, different views. Um, it was a monument created in memory of her son, Peter who died in, in, when he was only 19 years old in uh, 1914. And uh, it was finally finished in 1932. Um, I should tell you a little bit about her sculpture. Um, she sees, I think, first the graphic work of Ernst uh, Barlock, and then also his sculpture. And there's certainly a similarity, these very simple shapes uh, with strong emotion. Um, and this is uh, one, once again, the theme of death is very strong in her sculpture as well as her prints. Um, this relief is called Lamentation, and it's just, you know, the face with the hands held over it. Uh, and it was created in memory of Ernst Barlock, who was a very famous German printmaker and sculptor. Uh, and they, they came to be good friends, um, and he died in 1938. Um, this has been called both Pieta and just mother and child, or a mother and her dead son. And um, I think it was originally a small one, and they made a larger version of it and uh, placed it in one of the... Um, well, it was originally a guardhouse, and now it's a memorial. Uh, to the fallen in the war, and so you just have this big neoclassical building with this big opening, and right in the middle of it is um, this work, uh, which you can call Pieta. But you know, it's interesting that Pieta is uh, the name that we give to images of Mary holding her dead son Christ after the crucifixion. But here it's become a universal image. It's not necessarily Christ. I mean, I suppose you could read it that way. But it's any mother with their dead adult son. And it becomes a universal image and a universal image for um, the dead who have died in, in the wars. 
Of course, the war would. Um, so in this case, the word pieta takes on a more universal meaning, mother and child, rather than just Mary and, and Jesus. And um, this is her tombstone. The image that is reproduced on her tombstone, rest in the peace of his hands, uh, was uh, not, not this one, because this is the copy of it, uh, but the original was created in 1935. It was bronze work. Uh, and once again, you have this, this face uh, wrapped with drapery and large hands. And, and you, you, know, you wonder, you know, here is, it's, is this a child wrapped in his parents' arms? Or is it the human soul wrapped in the arms of God? And so it is an uh, appropriate funeral uh, motif. And as you can see, uh, buried, same place, her parents uh, and uh, her husband. And right at the bottom of the tombstone is Kathy Colwitt's name. <laughs>